Welcome to The Art of Medicine, the program that explores the arts, business, and clinical aspects of the practice of medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Wildner. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about one of medicine's nitty-gritty subjects, malpractice. And today, we're going to tackle another one, disability. You know, I've seen that there are patients who are disabled and they get disability, and I have many in my practice who have epilepsy. And then there are patients who have disability but don't seem to be able to get any compensation. And then there seem to be patients who don't have any disability at all, and yet they are on disability. And so I have a special guest here today, Spencer Bishens, who has enormous experience with this as an attorney and as a employee of the Social Security Administration. So he knows of what he speaks. But before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsor, locumstory.com. If you're considering locum tenens, either full-time or on the side, you probably have a question or two or 20. Fortunately, locumstory.com has the answers you need. It's packed with unbiased information and advice from physicians. Locumstory.com has nothing to sell. It's simply an information source. You'll find super handy tools that let you see locum tenants trends for your specialty and compare different locums agencies. There is even a quiz to help you decide if locums is right for you. Locumstory.com is the perfect place to start if you want to learn more about locums. That's locumstory.com. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce my guest, Spencer Vicious. Spencer, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. It's great to be with you. Well, the other reason, besides that you're an expert, I know that you're an expert because you recently published a book about this topic. And I don't think there are too many. You know, I think disability is mysterious. Every now and then a patient says, doctor, I need you to sign this for disability. And they hand me like a hundred pages of stuff. And it's like, well, I don't really have time to do this. And they go, you just sign the bottom. And it, it's just a mystery to me. I don't really know like what I'm, I want to help my patient, but I don't really right. know what I'm supposed to do. And patient really never knows what they're supposed to do. And it just seems to be something spiraling into some black hole of, you know, government, it's like calling the IRS. Yes, you'll be on hold for the next four days and then we'll get back to you, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, if you can bring some clarity to this situation, that would be great. Now, now tell us again your uh, background, please. Sure. I started with the Social Security Administration a couple of years after uh, finishing law school. Uh, so I started in 2010. And for the first four years, I worked in appeals. So those were disability decisions that had already been written. And I worked in the division that would review them to see if the decision was made correctly, if it was supported by the evidence. And then I transferred to a hearing office. And for the next seven years, I actually wrote the decisions. I wrote almost 2,000 disability decisions for a couple dozen administrative law judges who work for Social Security. So I was the Social Security employee until 2021. And when I left, I wanted to take all that experience. I had written and reviewed several thousand decisions, and that's a, a really big sample size, right? So I wanted to take all of that experience, all that knowledge, all that information, and give it to people. Because in this day and age, a lot of people get information from Facebook groups, or other places online. And a lot of that is anecdotal. It's, oh, here was my individual experience. And someone else will say, well, I had the exact opposite experience. And none of that is usable information. But I had seen thousands of cases, right? And I had gained all this knowledge. And when you have a sample size that big, you can draw a lot of really good conclusions. And so I wanted to take all that knowledge and information about how the system works, why it often doesn't, where all the roadblocks are, and explain to people, here's what you can expect. Here's what's going to happen so that people would be able to prepare. People would know what kind of medical records they need. Doctors would know what they need to put in a medical opinion for their patients. And everyone would know just a little bit more about the process so they could feel knowledgeable, but also just feel empowered to get through it. 
Great. Uh, do you have a copy of the book? I want to see what this looks like. So if I'm in the bookstore, I, do. I can reveal. Yeah, I think that's a yeah. great uh, why it's so hard to access benefits and what you can do about it. OK, um, well, my first question is, do I need <laughs> no, don't, don't do I need professional help? Can I just do as, it, you know, as as a claimant, as a claimant? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you do. And it's an odd thing for someone who wrote a book to say, like, oh, you also need to go and hire someone. Right. You were talking earlier about how there aren't a lot of books in this space. One of the reasons I wrote this book is that a lot of the books that are out there are self-help books, DIY books. Here's how here's all the information you need so that you can do this on your own and not have to pay a representative. Well, if I had seizures, I wouldn't try and diagnose myself with a seizure disorder. I would go to a neurologist. And if my car engine is a problem, I don't fix my own car engine and I don't fill my own cavities. So why, when I have a legal proceeding where tens of thousands of dollars are on the line, why is that the time when I all of a sudden decide to DIY something? That doesn't seem logical, right? So. I wrote the book because I think people need to understand the process. They need to know what evidence they're going to need. They need to know what providers to see, how social security is going to evaluate their claim, what's going to happen at a hearing. They need to educate themselves and know all of that information, but they also need a knowledgeable professional social security disability representative who knows the law, who knows the judges and procedures, and who can help them at the hearing best present their case. And I think that's really the winning formula. That's the formula that gives you the best chance at success is an educated claimant working with a professional representative to present the case in the best possible light. Okay, so that sounds like it would be someone local, ideally. Um, is that person... So how do I find that person, you know, in the phone book? Is that an right, attorney? Yeah. Uh, what so I, and I cover all this in the book, of course, but um, most social security disability representatives are attorneys, but not all of them. Social security can certify some non-attorneys to be representatives, and they're just as good as attorneys. It doesn't, you don't need someone who went to law school. You just need someone who knows the social security regulations and procedures really well. So in my experience from reviewing cases, I don't think it really matters much whether the person's an attorney or not, but there is an enormous difference in the quality of the evidence and in the quality of the presentation from someone who has no representative to someone who has some kind of representative. That's really, that's the big leap is having a representative not only lets you know how things are done. There are certain procedures, like for example, you have to have evidence to the judge at least seven days before the hearing. If you're doing that on your own and you don't know that and you walk into the hearing with new medical evidence, the judge doesn't have to consider that. And that's a rule, but the representatives know that rule. So that's just one of so many reasons. And I cover all these reasons in the book. I'm constantly explaining like, this is another reason you need a representative. Here's another rule you didn't know about. The representatives know how that works. But again, just like a doctor wants to have an educated patient who can come in and have a, a, an intelligent discussion about the diagnosis and the prognosis and different types of treatments, so too do social security disability representatives. They really do best when they have a, a claimant as a client who knows terminology, who knows what's about to happen. Instead of me having to explain to you what an RFC is, if you come in knowing, oh yeah, that's residual functional capacity. That just means what I can do with my impairments taken into account. I read the book, I already know that. I just saved my representative 10 minutes of having to explain this very simple term. Now we can actually talk about my case and make better use of that hour that we have together. So I think it's really important to educate yourself as a claimant, but also to understand you're not a professional. You need to know what's going on and hire a professional and let them do their job as well. Well, well I'll definitely second that. 
because about 15 years ago, I wrote a book called Epilepsy, 199 Answers, because I'm an epilepsy specialist. And it's like, I want right. all my patients to read that book so that when they come to see me, they already know what an EEG is, you know, right. we don't, so that we can sort of move to chapter two and exactly. instead of spending our very limited time, you know, in the, in the intro. So, uh, yes. Okay. Now clarify, I, when I was flipping through the book, I saw you can very quickly get into the weeds with, uh, details, but clarify one thing yeah. for me, does social security disability cover work related disability? In other words, they go to work, you know, something falls on them, can never work again. Yeah. And is that, is that the same or is that a whole separate thing? So there are separate programs. That's a very common situation, by the way. I saw lots of situations exactly like you just described, lots of construction workers and warehouse workers where either they're picking up something and, and something in their back just goes or something falls on them, all kinds of different warehouse. Warehouse is a very dangerous place to work. Um, but there are different programs. There's workers comp, there's unemployment, there might be private disability insurance companies and a, and a company might buy a private disability plan for their workers. And then of course, the one that I'm an expert on, which is social security disability. And that's the one that all Americans pay into, whether you're a W-2 employee or a 1099 independent contractor. Everyone who pays the social security tax, which you're required to pay by law, you don't have a choice, are part of that social security disability program. But usually a place like a warehouse or a construction site will also have to pay into a state's workers' comp program. So if someone gets hurt at work, there's usually that workers' comp process. But that's integrated into the social security disability process. And the way that works is when you get a workers' comp claim, you have to, the insurance company makes you go see a workers' comp doctor. Sometimes they're neurologists, a lot of times they're orthopedists. And they'll do tests and they'll do all kinds of a physical exam and they'll thoroughly evaluate you. But what they're doing is they're answering the question about whether you can return to your former job. So they're trying to figure out, one, is your injury actually work-related or did you have it before you started that job? And two, can you go back to that job? The social security's evaluation is very different for two reasons. One, social security doesn't care when the impairment started. They don't care if it predated that incident at work or not. They just take your body as it is and say, given this impairment or a combination of impairments, can you now work? The other thing though that social security does is they're not just asking, can you go back to your former job? Because the answer might be no, right? You might be hurt enough that you can't go work at a warehouse anymore. And so you might get a workers' comp claim approved because you can't go back to work in that warehouse. But social security standard is different. It's can you do any work that exists in significant numbers in the national economy? And that is, of course, a much more broad definition because now you're including jobs like cashier or even sedentary jobs like, and this is a real one, eyeglasses repairer, where your job is to screw those little screws into eyeglasses in a sitting position, very low level of physical stress, right? So because Social Security asks different questions, it's, it's for a different purpose and you get a different result. The same thing, by the way, happens with veterans because the VA only asks about whether you can go back to military service. Are you fit for military duty? Well, you may be unfit for military duty, but you could still be a cashier. So a lot of times people could get approved for something like VA benefits or workers comp, and then they're denied social security disability and they don't understand why. And I talk about this in the book, of course, it's because the definition, the legal definition of disability is different for social security than for these other programs. Well, that that is very helpful. That made my day. That cleared uh, some of the air. Now, there are many uh, medical professionals that uh, uh, are in the audience. So tell yeah. us, um, what kind of note do I write 
Now, or how do I fill out these forms that's going to help my patient who really does have a disability? Yeah, I'm guessing this is something that they probably don't cover in medical school or in like continuing education. And I don't, I don't know why, because someone like me, I got a lot of medical training, even though I'm a lawyer, because I have to understand medical records, right? I have to know if someone says I can't work because of a seizure disorder or epilepsy, I have to know how to read neurological medical records in order to know what to look for. And somehow I don't understand, but it seems like from my experience across the board, doctors aren't really getting the legal training they need. Not one as, minute, I'll say, not one minute. I have pretty extensive training and I, I can tell yeah, you not and, one minute. And, and doctors probably get a lot of people coming to them saying, I can't work anymore. I want to apply for disability. And it would be helpful for those doctors to read this book, Social Security Disability Revealed, so that they understand what their patients are going through and what kind of evidence that their patients need. And specifically with regard to medical opinions, oftentimes what, what I'll see, or when I work for Social Security, what I would see is something like, my patient is disabled and can't work. My patient can't work anymore and needs disability benefits, something like that. But that's almost, completely useless to the Social Security Administration. And the reason is the word disabled, as we just talked about a minute ago, is a legal term with a very specific de definition. And there's only one person who gets to be the adjudicator of what is disabled, and that's the Social Security Disability Judge. They decide is a person disabled. So if a doctor says my patient's disabled, no. Now you're a doctor giving a legal opinion and the judges don't like that. Hmm. They want the doctors to give medical opinions and they really value medical opinions. They're really important. But there's two things that a medical opinion has to have. The first is specific functional limitations. So as a neurologist, what I would be looking for if I had a patient claiming seizure disorder and a doctor giving a medical opinion, I would want to see what are the underlying neuro neurology records. So I know there's like a limited amount of tests that neurologists can do, especially if someone's having seizures at home, maybe it wasn't even witnessed. I do know there's a device someone can wear, and I've seen records where someone's wearing that, but in like that three-day period, they almost never have a seizure. <laughs> so <laughs> it's really hard Right. And I know, I know we know it's hard from the doctor's perspective because sometimes there is just no underlying objective evidence, but that's the first thing that a, a medical opinion needs is some kind of objective support so that when we see the opinion, the specific limitations, we know why those limitations are there. And the other thing, so, so those are the two things. The first is be really specific. So I'll give you an example. My patient cannot use his hands to write or type or do anything uh, requiring fine manipulation for more than 15 minutes at a time for more than two hours per day. That's really specific. And I know it takes a lot of time and doctor's time is really valuable, but that's a really specific opinion. And it tells the judge exactly what that person can and cannot do. Then I would want to see What's backing that up? Show me what test was done to support that limitation. And if a judge sees a specific limitation like that and objective evidence to back it up, it's a near certainty that that limitation is going to be put in the decision. And that, of course, is going to really restrict the number of jobs that person can do and make it more likely that that person is found disabled. But again, I realize that that's sometimes hard with specialties like neurology, but even with a specialty like orthopedics where you might have an MRI, MRIs can be interpreted in all kinds of different ways. If I see moderate degree of disc degeneration in the lumbar spine, I mean, I've written decisions where a moderate degree of disc degeneration had the person standing and walking eight hours a day and they weren't disabled all the way down to that person's in so much pain that they are disabled and the medical records were nearly identical. And that's where the doctor's expertise comes in. Show me the objective study, tell me what those limitations are 
tell me why what I'm seeing in this MRI report means what you say it means. And, and that's really the winning formula for a medical opinion, having good underlying evidence and really specific functional limitations. Okay, I, I think that's, that's really helpful. I, I wanna touch on maybe a, a delicate topic, and that yeah. is, I think a lot of physicians, including me, have the perception that there are people on disability who don't really need it. And I'll give you an example. I remember once I was watching one of these uh, wild world of sports type shows on television. They had this young guy who was like skiing down Mount Everest and doing, mm -hmm. you know, triple back flips. And he comes down to the bottom. And of course they interview him and they say, well, you know, how do you have enough, you know, time and support to train to be such a spectacular, you know, skier? Then the guy goes, well, I I'm on disability. <laughs> and I was mm -hmm. like, he's on disability. And so the, the reporter actually followed up with, sir, what's, what's your disability? And he goes, well, I work construction and you can see I lost the tip of my fifth finger in an accident. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, well, you know, that's unfortunate, but uh, it didn't prevent him from becoming a world-class skier, which does require a lot of, you know, attention skills and physical skills. And yet somehow he qualified for disability. Now, I don't know if that was workman's comp or, you know, how he did it, right. but it seems to happen. So tell us, first of all, it, it, it's the perception accurate. Are there a lot of people out there who don't deserve disability who actually have it? And if so, how did that happen? Yeah, there's so much to unpack here. Um, first thing I want to say is, from my experience, any injury to a finger, including amputation, if it's one finger, would not satisfy Social Security's definition of disability. Because uh, there's a listing that says it has to involve both hands. Um, literally, if you lost an entire arm, that might not satisfy Social Security's definition because you can do jobs involving standing and walking. All right, so, so the moral here is hang on to your body parts, please. Okay. So, right. um, but the other thing I want to say is Social Security is has a really robust system for reviewing medical evidence. And I talk about in the book how fraud, waste, and abuse is a term that gets thrown around by politicians and that we hear about but it's not a real thing as far as social security goes. It's just not possible for a claimant to con their way into social security disability benefits. Plenty of people have really good evidence and slip through the cracks and get denied, but you can't slip through the cracks and get approved because you have to have really good evidence showing functional limitations and underlying objective support that you can't do any job in the national economy for a full 12 months. And there's just so many requirements that no one's being accidentally approved. I, yeah, of course there's stories about people like trying to con the agency, but there's so many different points along the way where those people get caught to the point where I would almost never see those claims at the hearing level because if that was happening, they got caught so much earlier in the process. So every single claim I saw at the hearing level, including all the unfavorable decisions that I wrote, all the denials of benefits that I wrote, had good medical records, had medical evidence, ER visits, primary care visits, specialists, tests. Just because someone has denied disability benefits, it doesn't mean they don't have medical impairments. It just means they didn't meet that strict definition of disability. But there's one other thing I want to say because it sometimes can be really hard for people who don't have impairments or who have medical conditions, but they don't impact their ability to work necessarily, to understand that there's so many different ways a person can be impacted at work. And I'll give you an example of the type of case I saw a lot in social security. Let's say you have a veteran in their thirties who served overseas, maybe Iraq or Afghanistan, and they come back. And these are some of the fittest people on the planet physically. But a lot of times they can't even leave their homes. They can't go to a grocery store. And they'll say something like, I can't be around any other humans because I'm constantly afraid I'm going to get shot. So like, how am I ever supposed to go to work and focus and concentrate 
and have a boss and do it for 40 hours a week. So when you think about that example, you can really think about, okay, maybe there is more to, than just being able to stand or use your hands. That skier, I understand you said there was a thing about a fingertip, but what if that skier said, I have really severe PTSD from when I was in the military and I can be out here by myself skiing, but I, anytime I get near anyone else, I just get my heart races and I get really anxious and I can't think and I can't focus. So people have all kinds of different medical impairments and combinations of impairments, and they are impacted in all sorts of different ways. And so just because someone doesn't appear disabled or look disabled to, to you or to someone else, that doesn't mean there's not either a mental health disorder or non-visible physical disability like connective tissue disorder or fibromyalgia or possibly even a seizure disorder that's impacting them from being able to do a full-time work schedule on an ongoing basis. Uh, very helpful, very helpful. Now, uh, before we wrap up, I wanted to ask one more question. And you mentioned earlier that you worked with appeals. Yeah. So give us an idea. Okay, I've been rejected and you say, oh, right. I have a legitimate case I want to appeal. What are my chances just overall? Is you, do you, you know, like 1% are reversed or 50% are reversed? And, or And I do talk about, there's a whole section on appeals in the book because before I want to answer your question, I just want to say there's, you don't ever lose hope. There's never lost hope. Your case is never done. If it's rejected, you can appeal. If your appeal is rejected, you can file a new claim, you can get new evidence. There's always a next step in the process, but you have to know what those next steps are and that's all covered in the book. Uh, so to your question, when I worked at the Appeals Council, our reversal rate for hearing unfavorable hearing decisions was somewhere between 10 and 15%. Sometimes it's as high as 20%. It doesn't mean those people are going to be approved it just means there was some kind of error. The appeals council vacates, which just means gets rid of the decision and maybe sends it back to the judge to do a new hearing. You got this part wrong. You uh, didn't evaluate this medical opinion. You forgot to talk about this in the decision. You misinterpreted the law. You did something wrong. Go back and do it again. So uh, it's like the justice system when a, when a case is appealed and they say, okay, yeah, we'll just have to run it again because it was yeah, it, not done it is its own. It is its own justice system. And sometimes uh, cases can just be immediately paid on appeal. The Appeals Council, by the way, also, and this is the division I was in, also does take favorable decisions, randomly selects a certain amount of favorable decisions just to make sure that those ones that are being approved are actually well supported by evidence. And sometimes the appeals council can say, there wasn't quite enough evidence. You know, I, we talked about earlier about how you can't slip through the cracks and be appealed. Even if it comes anywhere close to that, and, and, it, and there's always evidence, but maybe the evidence isn't quite solid enough or doesn't quite show 12 continuous months or, well, this doctor didn't quite say the person can't work or, or just use the word disabled. That's not a good enough medical opinion. We're going to send that back to the judge, vacate a favorable decision and tell the judge, you have to do that one again. So your case is looked at at an initial level, a reconsideration level. By the time it gets to social security judge, that's the third level. Then if you appeal, it's going to a fourth level. And at each level, it's looked at by staff employees who prepare the medical record, by attorneys such as myself by the actual adjudicator. There's so many people looking at your medical evidence and making that decision. And that's why you just can't slip them by the agency. And if you try to, what the agency will do is send that case to their investigations unit. I like to just call them the disability cops. And that's a federal law enforcement agency that will basically go uh, conduct surveillance on you to see if you're lying and if you're saying you can do things, you can't do things and then you're doing them like, oh, I can't lift 10 pounds and then they catch you carrying grocery bags outside of the grocery store. 
And then, you know, now you're in trouble for lying to the federal government. So there's so many different ways that the agency makes sure that's just not happening. All right. Now, it sounds like a lot of people need your book. You know, if you're thinking about uh, applying for disability or even if you already have it and you want to hang on to it, it sounds yeah. like uh, and physicians, that's a great, of course. That's a great point, because if you've been rejected, there's an ex explanation in here about what to do next. But even if you've been approved, Social Security can and absolutely does take away benefits for all sorts of reasons. So I'm glad you brought that up. It's for applicants. It's for people who have been denied. It's also for people who have been approved. All right, Spencer, where can I get the book? Yeah, the book is Social Security Disability Revealed, Why It's So Hard to Access Benefits and What You Can Do About It. It's available in ebook and paperback on Amazon. It's also available on Kobo, Scrib, Apple, Barnes & Noble. And if you want to make it easy on yourself, just go to our website. It's bishinspublishing.com, B-I-S-H-I-N-S publishing.com. There's links to all the different places to buy the book. And if you want to follow along, our social media as well. Perfect. And, I, and I'll put that information in the show notes. Uh, Spencer, I want to thank you very much for being a very informative guest on The Art of Medicine. Thank you for having me. Finally, many thanks to The Art of Medicine's wonderful sponsor, locumstory.com. If you are interested in learning more about locum tenants or considering a new full-time position, go to locumstory.com. That's locumstory.com. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Wilner. Thanks for joining the program. See you next time. This program is hosted, edited, and produced by Andrew Wilner, MD, FACP, FAAN. Guests receive no financial compensation for their appearance on the art of medicine. Andrew Wilner, MD, is Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, Memphis, Tennessee. Views, thoughts, and opinions expressed on this program belong solely to Dr. Wilner and his guests and not necessarily to their employers, organizations, or other group or individual. While this program intends to be informative, it is meant for entertainment purposes only. The Art of Medicine does not offer professional financial, legal, or medical advice. Dr. Wilner and his guests assume no responsibility or liability for any damages, financial or otherwise, that arise in connection with consuming this program's content. Thanks for watching. For more episodes of The Art of Medicine, please subscribe www.andrewwilner.com